ever-present God, on this night, our whole world is engulfed in shadows as we remember the story of Jesus' death. And so we confess that we want to push the fast-forward button on this familiar story because it hurts so much. It hurts to think of the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. It hurts to imagine Jesus abandoned and suffering on the cross with only a faithful few watching him breathe his last breath. It hurts to watch your light overtaken by the shadows of the world, but we must find our place in the crucifixion story and feel the pain that is there, the pain of the world, of faithful decisions of betrayal of injustice Jesus entered that pain out of faithfulness to you and to us to witness the truth that is justice wholeness and love we confess we are afraid to enter this pain with Jesus strengthen us with your courage offer glimpses of hope in the shadows of death Let us know you are present with us here in this moment of pain. Bow as always. Amen. I cast my
shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. just want to welcome you, our online worshiping community, to this Good Friday online worship experience. You know, it's hard to get to the joy that comes on Easter morning without understanding the pain that brought Jesus to Good Friday. And yet we know the story we know that darkness will not have its way with God's kingdom, that joy and light come in the morning. So I want to remind everyone who is uh, sharing in this online worship experience of our Easter morning worship uh, a schedule. We will be sh worshiping inside the sanctuary at 9 o'clock in the morning. There's going to be an Easter egg hunt for all of the young folks, young kids, uh, starting at 10 o'clock. And then at 10.45, we're going to be moving everything outside. And you can come and join us at 10.45 for an outdoor sun Easter Sunday morning worship experience. Um, if you uh, still feel a little unsafe uh, gathering in that atmosphere, you're also welcome to come and drive in in your car. And uh, you can tune your radio in uh, to the broadcast frequency that we will be sharing that morning. And uh, you will be able to watch from your car and be able to listen from your car radio. Uh, if you are unable to come uh, and join us in person on Easter Sunday morning, uh, we are going to try as best we can to make our Easter morning worship experience available to view online no later than 3 o'clock Easter Sunday afternoon. And so won't you join me on this journey this evening where Jesus leaves the table with his closest friends, journeys to the garden, prays, is arrested, and eventually is led to the cross. Easter comes with light and joy and hope. But right now, 
settle yourself to experience Good Friday, may joy come in the morning for you, but may you experience these moments that might make Easter that much more meaningful. Worship with me. Amen. There's no place here for her kind. Whoa, still on she came through the shame that flushed her face until at last she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard as she poured her love from her box of alabaster and I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair You weren't there the night he found me You did not feel what I felt When he wrapped his loving arms around me And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster can't forget the way life used to be. I was prisoner to the sin that had me bound. I spent my days, poured my life without measure into a little treasure box. I thought
the Gospel of John, when it recounts those very, very last moments of Jesus' life, it shares with us these words, that there was a jar full of sour wine that was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Michelangelo, the name brings to our mind great artistry, architecture, sculpture, and to say his name is to be reminded of the places like the Sistine Chapel ceiling in the Vatican in Rome. Yet time and time again, it is recorded that Michelangelo left that work, tiring of it at times, to return to the native Florence that he loved so much, only to be coaxed back again and again by the Pope, insisting that he finish that work. Now when we think of his name, we think of great statues like Moses or David that he created. What we may not remember, however, is that he left far more works unfinished than finished by the time he died. Now there is a sacristy of a church in Florence that all of these unfinished masterpieces of Michelangelo were all gathered together. And by count, he left more works unfinished than complete. In the words of Cecil Rhodes, so much to do, so little time. Jason Tuscus was a 17-year-old. He was close to his mother and his father and his younger brother, Christian. And Jason was an expert swimmer and a person who loved to scuba dive. Art Tuscus said his son was an honor student and an athlete who often stayed home on weekends to help his disabled father, who was confined, by the way, to a wheelchair. Jason had taken up diving and loved the sport, and he had completed almost a hundred dives in his lifetime. My son, he feared nothing, Mr. Tuscus said. He died doing something that he loved. When he looked at sinkholes or springs, to him it was all just another challenge. He was willing to challenge the springs. He was fearless. Mr. Tuscus, 51, said that morning started out happily. It was his wife's 42nd birthday, and a party was planned for that afternoon. Jason had planned to go on a driving trip to the Gulf of Mexico, but when the diving trip was canceled, he called his father for permission to go diving in a small spring in a place called Jenkins Creek. A friend had lost a diving knife there, and Jason was going to help him find it. He said he would be back by 2 p.m. Well, that was at least when the party was supposed to begin for his mother. So his father gave permission because Jason had dived in that same spring just a few months before. If I had known it was so dangerous, my son never would have been there, Tuscus said. Jason was exploring an underwater cave, but became wedged in a narrow passageway. And when he realized that he was trapped, Jason decided that he would shed his metal air tank and unsheath his diver's knife. So with the tank as a tablet and his knife as a pen, he wrote one last message to his family. I love you, Mom, Dad, and Christian. And then he ran out of air and he drowned. It was a personal message from my son, Mr. Tuskis said. It was his last words that he carved underwater, and they will be a part of the decor of my house forever. Jason Tuskis was so young, with so much life left to live. He was strong and adventurous, which, uh, 
with so much more his family knew that he wanted to do and to be. For him, life was very much not finished. Imagine for yourself, living nearly 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem. You're a Jew, living in the region of Judea. It's the week of Passover, and you and your family have journeyed to Jerusalem for this special event. And now, as the week ends, you have been caught up in an event that you could never, ever have imagined, a crucifixion. And as you stand there, looking at the beaten, battered, torn, and blood-soaked body of a man named Jesus, you hear him speak his last words. It is finished. And then scripture records that he breathed his last and gave up his spirit. Now as a Jew, you had hoped it would be a special week for you and your family. After all, Passover is the greatest anticipated event of the year. You look forward to the celebrations and the parties meeting old friends and family that you might not have seen for a whole year. There were also the traditional religious aspects of the week. You spent a good deal of time remembering their importance as well. You arrive in town last Sunday and after resting on the Sabbath. And when you go to Jerusalem, there was a strange atmosphere in the city. People were excited about someone who was coming to Jerusalem to also celebrate the Passover. You've heard rumors about this man, but you never had the opportunity to see or hear him. You knew that his name is Jesus and that he came from a place called Nazareth. People say that, said that he had done great miracles and that was, he was a wonderful teacher. They say he teaches as one who has authority from God, even though he wasn't educated under the Pharisees. There are even a few who are brave enough to say that he is the Messiah, the one that the Jews have been waiting for for so long. You have heard that he can feed an entire army with just a few fish and loaves. And now... People are claiming that he is able to raise the dead. So when he comes to town just this last Sunday, you were not surprised to see people hailing him and shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You even cut down a palm branch yourself and find yourself waving it, it like so many others as he rides by. So here it is, my friends, it's Friday, and much has happened since last Sunday. Now reflecting back, you recall how he literally ransacked the temple. That led to a confrontation with the, the spiritual leaders and teachers because he had called them hypocrites and even a brood of vipers. And then you heard Jesus say that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in just three days. So last night, they finally had enough and they arrested him. This morning, you waited in the praetorian with the crowd as he stood before Pilate. And after all the proceedings, Pilate had brought out just two men and offered to release one of them. It was either Jesus or a man named Barabbas. And someone yelled that he wants Barabbas to go free. And it wasn't long before everyone was calling for his release. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Pilate asked us what he should do with Jesus. And one of the Pharisees yelled, crucify him. Soon everyone was yelling, crucify Crucify, crucify, crucify. So Pilate relented and Barabbas is released. Still not wanting to execute Jesus, Pilate gives the order to have him beaten. 
It isn't long before you hear the crack of the leather against Jesus' flesh. The crowd goes quiet. Finally, just before Jesus passes out, they stop. The beating has ended, but Jesus will carry the pain of all of that beating all the way until the very end. For the while, the crowd goes silent. You gasp as you see his torn flesh and bruised body, blood everywhere. But stop for a minute, my friends. Stop for a minute and look a little bit closer. Do you really see him? Look beyond the blood from the thorns. Look past the bruises and the lacerations. Ignore the redness from his beard that was being pulled out by another's hand. Under it all, there is a look of a man who is absolutely determined to accomplish his mission. It is the look of a man who is committed to see this thing through to the end. One of the soldiers brings the crossbeam over, ties it to his back. He stumbles out onto the street under the weight of the beam. And even though you can't see it, it isn't the only weight that he is carrying. The burden that he carries is not just a beam of wood, but the burden of our sin. Halfway to Golgotha, appropriately named because it means the place of the skull, Jesus stumbles. The Roman soldier looks around. If you were there, maybe his eyes settle on you for just a second and your heart jumps. Finally, he points out to the man behind you and Simon of Cyrene is given the cross to carry. There in front of the upright beam planted in the ground, Jesus lies down on the cross. He was placed between two thieves and finally, a soldier pulls out a long spike. They stretch out his arm, and the centurion holds a spike up against Jesus' wrist. When he finishes nailing Jesus to that crossbeam, the other soldiers come and assist him in lifting Jesus up onto the standard. As the soldiers finish their nasty job, and move back to observe their handiwork, Jesus looks up and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there, there he hangs. Time passes. People come and go that are watching the spectacle. And eventually noon arrives. And things start to grow mysteriously dim. There's a chill in the air. And then, darkness. Finally, Jesus lifts himself up by the nails in his feet, by the nails in his hands. And with his dying breath, he says these words. It is finished. You know, like Michelangelo and Jason Tuscus, what we want to do in this life can't possibly ever truly be finished. We will never ever be able to accomplish all that we want to accomplish in the time that we have has been given us to walk this earth. So let's just put that goal aside. But here I bear witness to proclaim that Jesus did. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, Jesus accomplished all that God had wanted him to do, and that is what makes Good Friday good. In the fourth course of Chicken Soup for the Soul, Ted Kruger writes about the only memory that lingers. And here's what he shares. I have many memories about my father and about growing up with him in our apartment next to a set of elevated train tracks. 
For 20 years we listened to the roar of the train as it passed by his bedroom window. And late at night he waited alone on the tracks for the train that took him to his job at a factory where he worked the midnight shift. On this particular night, I waited with him, Ted Kruger says. I waited with him in the dark because I wanted to say goodbye. His face was grim. You see, his youngest, him being his youngest son, he had been drafted. I would be sworn in at six the next morning, Ted writes. And while he stood uh, at his paper cutting machine in the factory was when Ted would be sworn in. My father had talked about his anger. He didn't want them to take his child, only 19 years old, who had never had a drink or smoked a cigarette, to go and to fight in a war in Europe. He placed his hands on my slim shoulders. You be careful, and if you ever need anything, write to me, and I'll see that you get it. Suddenly, he heard the roar of the approaching train. He held me tightly in his arms and gently kissed me on the cheek. And With tears filling his eyes, he murmured, I love you, my son. And then the train arrived, the doors closed him inside, and he disappeared into the night. One month later, at age 46, he writes that my father died. He says, I am 76 years old as I sit and write this. I once heard Pete Hamill, the New York reporter, say that memories are man's greatest inheritance. And I have to agree. You see, when I was drafted, I lived through four invasions in World War II. I had a life full of all kinds of experiences. But the memory that lingers is of that night when my dad said, I love you, son. 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, God, our Heavenly Father, said, I love you, my child. The book of Romans tells us that God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so, my friends in Christ, I pray that this is more than just a lingering memory for you. I pray that you have received the gift that Jesus purchased for you because of that day on Calvary that we call Good Friday. I pray that you know the freedom and the assurance that eternal life brings through faith in the work that Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. Because my friends in Christ, it is finished. a moment when the lights went out and death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history for on a cross they made the sinner Every curse is blood atoned. The final breath and it was finished. Not the end we could have known. The earth began to shake. 
Get it? 